Yeah, um, the slide link is here if you want to access it. Um, maybe I'll write it down. Oh, Okay. Um, so, let's see. Does this work? Yes, it works. Okay. So, today we'll be talking about uh, briefly an overview of Linux and then basically how um, the talk itself will be not very technical. Um, we won't be talking about how like Linux works or things like that. It's more about how the um, development of Linux works and so how do you and also some ideas about if you are working in the Linux kernel, um, like how do you navigate the source and things like that. So just some, some things that I have found out um, over like you know working with it just a bit. I haven't like I haven't really worked with it a lot. Yeah, but just a bit. So and then I have a little demo at the end of like um, you know uh, from an idea of a change and then we get all the way to a patch that you can submit. So let's go. So first, um, Linux, so some uh, <laughs> history. So Linux was first, um, I guess, Linus Torvalds, okay, Linus Torvalds started working on it in, um, I think like April of 1991. And he was undergraduate at the uh, Uni of Helsinki. Um, like, ju just like us, I guess. <laughs> uh, yeah, so there's, I think there's a few reasons he was working on it, but Basically, I think one of the main reasons was he he had he didn't really like something about Minix. Minix was a OS a textbook soft textbook kernel that was written for one of um, Andrew Tannenbaum's textbooks, I believe. And um, Linus Linus didn't like it, so he and I guess he wanted a hobby project and things like that. So he worked on Linux, the Linux kernel. And then, like in a, no in August of 1991, he sends this email which is still up on uh, Google Group's archive. If you have the slides open, you can just click on a photo. Hey, let me just click on it. Damn it. I think you need to be logged into Google. Never mind. So, yeah. Um, he says, oh, he sends this to the Minix uh, group, which is, um, you know, um, he says, oh, I'm doing a free operating system uh, won't be big and professional. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Look where he is now. Um, yeah, and, and then, so that's basically the start of Linux. Linux. And, okay, so August 91, he first sent the email. Uh, December 91, the kernel became self-hosting. So what this means is the kernel, you can compile itself and then run it. So it's self-hosting. Um, then January 92, Tenenbaum says, oh, Linux is obsolete. Um, so he thinks, Tenenbaum thinks that um, monolithic kernels, which I will talk about briefly, are um, obsolete and we should all use microkernels. Because Minix is a microkernel. And I mean, uh, just look at it today. I, I don't think monolithic kernels are obsolete yet. Although we have uh, Google coming out with like Fusia and Zircon. So we'll see what happens about that. Um, in Feb 92, Linus, Linus converts the kernel from his uh, strange, his own custom license, which forbids certain commercial things to GPL2, which he, I think he says that this is the best decision he has done for the kernel. Yeah, which I, I, I guess I personally agree. Um, but that, that's another whole another, that's a whole another talk <coughs> on the license, licenses. Um, in March 94, they reach 1.0, although the kernel version numbering is kind of arbitrary. Um, yeah, so at the start it was like 1.0, 1.1, 1.2, and then you have like patch level. So, um, like, um, if there are patches to a certain release, then it'll be like 1.0.1, 1.1.2, .1, and so on. And this happened all the way until, and okay, then two years later they released 2.0. So this was semi arbitrary as well. Actually, the kernel, the kernel number is basically entirely arbitrary. Then, um, in December 03, they release, so that, there's a number of releases in between, but 2.6 is kind of notable because they stayed on 2.6 for about eight years. 
right? Because Linus was like, oh, the kernel is quite stable now. So let's just stay on 2.6, and then we release 2.6 point, what, one point something. And then after that, so they reach about 2.6 point 30 point something. And then Linus was like, okay, let's change again. So in July of 11, they changed the new versioning scheme, which is what it is now. Basically, it's just, um, 3.0 was, a, he just said, okay, this, the next version will be 3.0. And then every few months, they will release the next version will be 3.1, 3.2, until 3.20, which is when Linus is like, I can't count with my fingers, fingers and toes anymore. And so we go to 4.0. And then so recently, I think, was it December? December of 18, we released 4.20. And then Linus is like, okay, the number's getting big again, so we're going to go for 5.0. And in March 19, uh, last month, we got 5.0. So that's where the kernel is now. Yeah, the kernel versioning is quite arbitrary. I, I personally think that it should be something similar to like, um, you know how Chrome and Firefox number their versions because it's just, every release is just plus one, right? B because that's what it is now. It's just that Linux wants a smaller number at the start for some reason. I don't know. Okay. And uh, <laughs> so I, I, while researching for this presentation, I actually found this. I actually found, okay, I don't quote me on the IPA because I am not a linguist, I, but this is, I think, what, I think this is the correct IPA. But this is a recording of um, Linus himself saying, um, Hello, this is Linus Torvalds, and I pronounce Linux as Linux. Yeah, so it's Linux. I, I don't know. But anyway, everyone just says Linux, right? So. I do. I do. I do. <laughs> okay. Yeah. But this is, it's it's like on the Linux. See, I, I did it again. It's on the Linux um, CDN, so it's it's real. Okay. So what is Linux? Um, Linux is a monolithic kernel. And so then, what's kernel, right? So, okay, for if you don't know, um, the kernel is basically what sits between your program. Let's say you write a program saying print hello world, right? Um, so, what happens between from that print call all the way to when the hello world appears on the screen? There's quite a lot of things going on, but one of the things is the kernel. Oh, well, okay, let's say you're writing in C. So, you say something like printf hello world. And then your printf, printf is a function in the C standard library. And if you're on Linux, Linux, <laughs> if you're on Linux, um, the C, you probably be using um, the GNU C library, which is glibc. So glibc will have, uh, eventually, it will end up in a write call. So a write, write syscall. So a syscall is basically what programs in, um, user space used to talk to the kernel. And so what is user space? User space is basically everything that is in, a, okay, if you're talking about x86, then you have this concept of rings. So basically, when you're in user space, you are sort of restricted. Uh, the kernel controls what you're doing. And then you have kernel space where you have full access to everything. Uh, I'm glossing over details, but you have full access to the hardware and things like that. So if you have, you can't have your programs running in kernel space, at least in, in the past it used to be the case, like real mode, but uh, today you don't have programs running in kernel space because like you have nothing, pro I mean, um, you have nothing like to protect. Like, let's say your, your, if your program wants to write anywhere in memory, then if you're running in kernel space, you can. But, so that's why you have programs running in user space and the kernel also has, um, yeah, so the kernel sits between your program and your hardware. And most of the things in the kernel are basically device drivers. Right? So they help sort of abstract away all the different hardware into a common interface that your programs can um, use, like the right, right syscall and so on. And then among other things are also like process management. So like you have different um, programs running on your system simultaneously and the kernel will handle the CPU and scheduling each program to run and also handle your mem memory, so like um, handle your memory management unit, MMU, 
uh, to say like, oh, your program can only write to here and here. You cannot write out of that. If you write out of that, then I will kill you. Um, that's what it does, right? That's, that's what a sec fault is, when your program tries to read or write out of where it is allowed to. And so, so what's the main difference between a monolithic and microkernel, right? Um, when you have a monolithic kernel, well, your process management and your memory management, the basic things will, will always be in kernel space. But in a monolithic kernel, the drivers that interact with your hardware, those are also in the kernel. When you have a microkernel, basically most of these things here, your drivers are in user space, right? And they run as um, user processors. So um, there are arguments against and for microkernels and monolithic kernels, but uh, I probably won't go into that here. Um, most OSs today are monolithic kernels. Linux? OK, most desktop. Most desktop. Most are hybrid. Hybrid. Uh, will you say Windows is? Windows is hybrid. It's hybrid. It's hybrid. It's hybrid. It's hybrid. More mono hybrid, but it's hybrid. I will. I will. I will say still it's closer to monolithic than. I think it's monolithic. I will say Windows is still monolithic because. Uh, iOS and Mac OS are pretty hybrid. Okay. It's quite. Okay, so yeah, so that's why I'm glossing over a lot of detail here, but but as for Windows, I would still say it is closer to monolithic than microkernel. It's it's in between, but I think it's closer to monolithic. It's closer to monolithic. Yeah. But it's still hybrid. It's hybrid. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, let's get past that. Because that's not the topic of today's talk. So today's talk, we're talking about how the Linux kernel is developed. Okay, so how patches get into the kernel. So okay, so just an overview. So today, like today, like now, um, thousands of people contribute per year, right? And we have about like one thousand patches per day during merge windows. Uh, that's according to like the, their own statistics. So to f um, about yeah, uh, one point seven thousand people contributed to version five, right? And you have more than twelve point five thousand non-merge commits in five point. What what what? what a merge commit is the git merge commit when you have a merge. So that's just a commit that brings two trees together. Um, so we're talking about non-merge commit means commits that actually change code. So twelve point five thousand. So how in the world do you manage so many commits, right? And would you suggest like GitHub or GitLab? Um, so I actually most of the the slides I have linked to like different people's views on uh, rather like blog posts or documentation. So this person who is a contributor um, who works on the Linux kernel, right? Um, he has he has written a post about why. Um, GitHub can't host the kernel, but main, I, for me, the, I think the main problem is that GitHub can't scale, right? Because the way the kernel works, right? Um, the, the, the kernel is structured in such a way that it's a single, like everything is built together. Linux, okay? And so you can't really separate the source tree into multiple reposit uh, repositories, right? Um, okay, you could but it won't work very well, right? It won't be very convenient. Like, how do you, because it has to be built together. So how will you separate it into multiple trees? Do you separate like individual drivers out, individual subsystems out? But the thing is, there are, there are, there are dependencies between subsystems. And then what if you have, um, for example, you change a core kernel API. Now how do you, then everything that uses that API has to change. And in Linux, that is very simple because the person that does the change to the API will change every user as well because they can do that because everything is one tree, so they can do that. But if you don't, then how do you do this if, let's say, you have, you're on GitHub and you're split into multiple repos? Or, you know, and yeah. And the other thing is, okay, if 
you are on GitHub or GitLab or whatever centralized service there is, then if GitHub is down, and if all your pull requests, comments, all the meta metadata, not just the code, because Git is decentralized, so you have everything. But if GitHub is down, how do you access your, you know, your pull requests, comments, your well, everything? Everything will be down, right? So that's why the kernel uses uh, basically email, and um, which I'll talk about later. But so okay. So how does the kernel actually work? So let's imagine you have a change, right? You have created a patch. Um, what you do as a developer is you will email that patch to a maintainer for that source file. And there is, um, so there is a list of maintainers, which is inside the Git, uh, the Linux tree. And then basically it lists the maintainer for each individual you know, directory or file and so on. And so when you create a patch, you will email it to um, whoever is listed here, as well as the subsystem uh, maintainer, and possibly the um, mailing list for that subsystem, and so on. But the most, important, the most important person you email is, of course, the person that is maintaining the file. And so you email that person, and he will vet your code, and give you comments, and so on. And other developers that, receive, uh, uh, that are subscribed to the mailing list will give you comments, and so on. And then you eventually the patch will be accepted. Then so the now the maintainer will apply your patch, which you send by email, to his tree. Right? And then he will aggregate changes to his files. And then he will send a pull request to the maintainer of the subsystem that his or that you know, basically a next maintainer that is above him. And that, that maintain will vet and everything, and then eventually you pull it into his own tree and so on. And eventually, everything will make it up to Linus Talbot. So, and so um, basically, the stable, or what we call the mainline kernel, is basically um, Linus's tree. So, yeah. It, you, you could be using, if you're using a distro kernel, it won't be Linus's, it won't be exactly. Um, the mainline kernel, right? It'll be probably some patches applied on top and so on. Um, but what we call the mainline Linux is Linux's tree. So let's follow a patch. Okay, so this is just a random patch that I picked, right? It's, it's nothing, I, I didn't pick it for any reason. Did you work on it? No, I, I didn't want to pick the one that I worked on. Although you can find it, like, because the Linux kernel requires you to con contribute under your real name. Although you could come up with a fake real name, but I didn't. <laughs> okay, so this is just a random patch. You can see that it was authored, um, you know, it was written February, and then it got committed, so-called, in, uh, in April. So let's see, let's look at the initial email. All right, so this guy emails, um, with the patch, with subject saying patch, and this is the commit title. This is the commit message and so on, right? And we won't go into the patch details, but basically, right? Then this is this guy is the maintainer for that file, and he says, um, yeah, he gives the guy some comments, right? So he gives the guy some comments, and then so the guy responds with version three. Oops. The guy rep responds with a new version of the patch, right? And he has fixed the problems. So now the maintainer says, thank you. Okay. So that means he has pulled it into, he has pulled it into his tree. And so we can actually go and look at it, right? Yeah, so he accepted it. So we can actually go and look at, um, this guy's name is Jaco, Jaco's tree. So his tree will be here. And you can actually go and look at it. And if you look at the short log, okay, there's a lot of changes, but hmm. Hmm. 
we know it will be in um, February. No, that's not him. That's not that's him, but it's not that change. Okay, there's actually a lot of changes. I should have found this earlier. But yeah, so basically, um, Jaco will pull it into his tree, which is located in this location. And then, oh sure. <laughs> Thanks. Okay, so let's look at the. Okay, so I'm not going to copy the commit hash because you can't actually use that. You can't use that because it's a different commit, right? Uh, because yeah, when you pull it in, then the Jaco will have at his com uh, author, uh, sorry, committer information, and so the commit hash changes. Um, okay, let me get the let me get the commit title, which is this. Yeah, the. <laughs> uh, it'll take a while. <laughs> I'm not even doing. I'm not. I didn't even enable RE. Okay, uh, we'll just continue, and then uh, when it's done, we'll take it. Take a look at it. Okay, so after Jaco accepted it, then like about one month later, one month later, um, Jaco sends a pull request to the maintainer of that, the TPM subsystem. Right. So hi James, these are fixes for 5.1, and then he said, and okay, so this line onwards is basically what um, Git generates when you send an email pull request. The following changes since this commit are available in yeah. Gateway timeout, nice. Uh, let's not look at it then. <laughs> but yeah, so uh, Jaco now sends a pull request to his um, next maintainer, right? And so you can see that that includes this change that we, we just looked at, right? And now the maintainer, a few weeks later, maintainer sends a pull request to Torvalds. So, see, to Torvalds. Uh, please pull these TM, TPM fixes. And um, okay, Torvalds doesn't reply because he has a bot to reply for him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and yeah, if you go and look at it, then you can see that the comment actually went into Torvalds tree. Uh. Yeah. So that's basically the life cycle of a patch in Linux, right? Um, so how would this compare to GitHub? I actually cannot imagine how Linux will work on GitHub because like uh, there are projects that are pretty large on GitHub, like. But personally, I've like dealt with Rust community, so Rust I would is is large-ish, right? And, and they on GitHub. But I think the difference is that Rust does have it's like what what they have is like compiler, standard library. So that 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 sort of can go into one repository. And they have a lot of other like um, smaller libraries that are separate, and it, those can work separately. They don't have to be part of you know the stand, the, the single mono repo that is Rust, so it, it works fine. Because, but in the problem with Linux is that everything is sort of um, you know depends on each other, and it's very hard to actually separate things out. And also there's sort of um, like if you look at Windows, right? Um, drivers there's a sort of driver API, and so um, in Windows you have the, the people who write the drivers are actually the device manufacturers, right, generally, and then they just write the drivers themselves and they ship it to you directly. Oh, okay, they can use Microsoft, but it's not, Microsoft doesn't like, you know, maintain a source repository with all the drivers. In contrast, okay, Linux does let you compile out of three drivers, that's what we call it, but we generally prefer that drivers are mainlined, what we call it, so they're <coughs> included into the main tree. Why is because that, um, so, if you have a driver mainline, then um, well, one thing is everyone can work on it together. Um, and if there are any changes to kernel APIs, you are not responsible for fixing it. The person who changed the API will fix it for you, right? So that's, that's great. So um, someone said once, I can't remember where, I think it was Greg KH. So Greg is the person who maintains stable kernels. Um, he said that um, in an email that 
uh, is again that explains why Linux doesn't have a stable driver API. Um, he said that Linux kernels, uh, Linux drivers are generally about up to like one third the size of the drivers of like Windows because um, they don't have to like maintain you know uh, code to work with different versions of the kernel and so on. Like you, like the driver that ships with this kernel works with this kernel and like any obsolete code you can just throw it out because you know the driver is in the tree so it's part of the whole kernel. And I think that's pretty nice. Um, there are people who prefer you know, having a stable driver API. And, but Linux explicitly says that the internal APIs are not stable. And, but it works, right? And there are benefits to it. So uh, personally, I, I'm, I'm in favor of this. But there have, there, there's always arguments and people who come in and say, you know, uh, why don't we have a stable API and so on? Yeah. Okay, so we talk about the Linux release cycle. So basically what happens, oh, this is what happens now. So in the past, it probably was different. Um, but what happens now is basically, uh, so this is just, so let's say we have 5.0 released, right? Okay, let's say we have 5.0 released. So the moment 5.0 is released, the merge window for the next release starts. So it usually lasts about one, two weeks. So in this merge window, um, the subsystem maintainers will send their pull requests to Linux, and they will accept all the pull requests. Linux will accept whatever changes, new, new features, uh, major changes that could break things, and so on, all go into the kernel during this merge window. So it lasts about one to two weeks. And as when Linux thinks it's appropriate, he release RC1. And when the more RC1 is released, the merge window is closed, right? And the, from RC1 until usually, depending on the, the, you know, the changes that go in, there's about six to nine RCs, release candidates. And so basically, we, people test the kernel, test the new changes, and fix things. So anything that, anything that goes in at this point is just fixes, or potentially things that cannot break the rest of the kernel. And yeah, when Linux thinks it's about the right time, basically when the patches that are going in are, start to dwindle down, then he'll release the next version. So usually cycle lasts about three months, but it's really up to Linux. Right. And once the uh, version is released, so we have, let's say the next version will be 5.1. So I think now we're at 5.1 RC3. Uh, the, the, so when the next version is released, then um, Greg Cage will take over that version, and he'll start uh, producing the stable um, patch level, so 5.1.1 and so on. So that's how the release cycle works, basically. And that's how, basically, so the moment from when you submit a patch to your the maintainer uh, to the moment where it appears and is released in a stable kernel could probably, will probably be at least three months because depending on your patch, it could be, if your patch is a fix for a serious bug, it'll definitely go in immediately. But if your patch is like a new feature, something not that urgent, it will probably take three months because you have to wait for the next merge window and then all the way until that, that, that release is released. OK, so yeah. So what does Linux use to handle all this? Uh, well, email mailing lists. So you can go and see. So Linux has uh, many, many, many <coughs> mailing lists. Right? It's basically one mailing list per subsystem or architecture. And um, so when you submit a patch, you will submit to that mailing list. And there's also one mailing list called Linux kernel, which is basically the mega, mega mailing list and everything goes there. But yeah. And they use Git, which was written for Linux. So there's a lot of Linux specific things in Git. Like for example, who actually uses Git send email, right? Well, Linux developers do. Isn't that quite new? Uh? Hmm? I'm not sure. I don't think so. It's in the kernel docs for been, it's been there for quite a while. Like git send dash email. Uh, you can like so basically what git send email does is it will just you you give it your SMTP credentials and it will just do the sending for you. Yeah. Um, and there are people who don't like git because it has a terrible UI. So they use Mercurial and apparently it works. I, I personally haven't tried it because I think Mercurial is very slow. And there are also a few tools like Patchwork and Bugzilla. So Patchwork is this website where 
that tracks the patches that are emailed into the Linux kernel. But it's, it's basically a nicer UI to look at patches instead of looking at the mailing list archives. There's also Bugzilla. And so the funny thing was, is that Bugzilla exists, right? And so people, like, users of the kernel will actually report bugs into Bugzilla. But developers don't look at Bugzilla. <laughs> they look at the mailing list. So the Bugzilla has been described sort of as a black hole or death knell of bugs because a lot of things are there. But developers generally don't look at it. Only a few people do. The people commenting there are generally all users. <laughs> Quite unfortunate. So if you ever encounter a bug in a Linux kernel, actually the best place, you can report it bugzilla, but also email the mailing list. Because the mailing list is not just for patches, it's also for discussion and things about that subsystem. Yeah. Okay, so submitting kernel, kernel patches. So this um, links to basically the kernel's own documentation. So which I, I definitely, I'm not going to replicate that here. I'm just going to go through the overall process and a very simple process which works, right? But there are a lot of details that uh, you know may be worth knowing, so you should read the documentation if you do want to contribute to the Linux kernel. Okay, so the first thing you need to do is of course uh, have a commit, right? So basically, you will before this you will have cloned the Git, uh, the Linux tree, right? Um, do your changes, fixes, whatever, and you commit your changes. And so one thing to take note is when you commit, so. Um, Linux uses this thing called the developer certificate of origin. I don't remember correctly. Yeah. So they look they want you to have this line at the end said signed off by you. Oops. No. <laughs> That's not right. They want you to Yeah. So basically they, uh, they want you to add this line at the end of the commit. So if you look at the Linux tree, right, every commit has this line saying signed off by your name, your email. And basically by adding that line, you certify that um, all this stuff. Uh, it's just Linux things. Um, right? And the other thing about Linux is that the commit messages are very, very, very detailed, which I, personally I am a fan of. So when for my own projects, I also enforce some sort of uh, commit message discipline, but I, I, a lot of people don't. And I, I get very <laughs> get very irritated when I see commit messages that are just totally trash. Because, okay, let's look at, let's, let's just look at the commit message. Okay, this, this is the commit title. The commit title is the first line of the commit message, right? And uh, you can already see there is some sort of discipline that goes on here. Basically, they talk about the, they describe the subsystem they say like you know, which subsystem it is or whatever, and then like the change, right? And it will the change will always it will always be an imperative statement. So open this in a muffled mode, or extend the test, or fix something, or change this, or change that, right? And this is just the first line. So every commit will have a very long explanation behind it, like this one. Okay, it's not very long, but I have seen you have if you look at if you look through the history. You can see commit messages that, that are like paragraphs long, and they include like um, a ration, uh, description of the bug, uh, a minimal repro of the bug, basically code in your commit message to repro the bug, and more things at the end. Yeah. So, so um, yeah, you when you are committing to a link skull, you should definitely have uh, elaborate commit message because actually the. When you are sending your patch, you have to justify your patch, right? And so your justification is your commit message. So yeah, if you're in doubt about what you should be saying, then just look at the past commit messages for that file. And that's one of the greater, great things about committing to, or, or one of the things that can help you when you're working with Linux, because there is so much work done already. So when you're in doubt, you just look at what has been done and try and figure your way from there. OK. Then from there, it's just uh, you, know, you generate the patch. Then there are scripts to help you check your coding style, the patch style, any issues. Well, not it, it's not perfect, but it catches a lot of issues. And it's written in Perl, which is. <laughs> okay, then you use another script to um, figure out who to email. Right? And then you send off the email. And that's the other caveat when you're contributing to Linux, which is that you have to be using a client that doesn't mangle patches. Because 
Okay. Um, Linux uses tabs. I, I don't know. Okay. Some people hate tabs. <laughs> but Linux, generally, the codes, uh, the indentation style uses tabs. And if you try and paste your patch into, like, let's say, the Gmail web interface, all your tabs are converted to spaces. And now your patch doesn't work at all. Because when you, you apply a patch, you can't, it doesn't fix the, the white space for you. Right. So you have to use an uh, appropriate client. So there, this link basically links to, again, the kernel docs, which tells you um, certain things or certain ways to configure certain clients to make them work with contributing Linux. So um, you can't use Gmail web interface. Forget about it. Uh, you can't use Outlook web interface. Forget about that. Um, basically, you have to use an offline client. So for me, I've, I use Thunderbird. Um, I think Linux developers like to use MUT. Um, but basically, anything that's not a web interface has a good chance of working. But for Thunderbolt, you need to you know, uh, tweak some settings so that it doesn't auto flow your patches and things like that, and it doesn't mangle your white space. But yeah. Um, then after that, you just wait for feedback, and then you send additional versions of your patch, and so on, and that, that's it. Right. So the last thing, of course, is so now if you're working in a kernel, how do you actually navigate through the kernel? Because the kernel has 15 million lines of code, right? And yeah, you have to find your way through it, lah. Okay. Well, one of the first things you need to be able to do is to actually test your changes, right? So I think if you haven't done this before, then it, you you can go and play with it if you use Linux, right? Um, to compile the kernel, compile your own kernel, and Run it on your system or in a VM, like if you if you are paranoid. But so what? How do you compile a kernel? You can okay. You can clone a tree or you can download a release tarball, right? And you just configure the kernel. So what configure, configuring a kernel does is basically selects the drivers and options for so that the kernel can run on your system. Um, there are a lot of scripts to help you do this configuration, but. I put local yes config here because what this does is basically um, takes the current config you have as well as the modules or drivers that are loaded for your system and then it will make a config that will work for your system. But there are also other, you know, there's a GUI like graphical configurator and so on that lets you just choose what you need and so on. But yeah. Or the other way, the other option is to just look for what your distro, the config that your distribution uses and just use that because that should work. You make the kernel. So this can take like between five minutes and like half an hour or one hour, depending on what you have selected and your computer. Then you install it, right? And then you configure your bootloader to boot the kernel. Uh, it's very hard to go into the details because everyone has a different setup. Or alternatively, and if you are going to use your own kernel like for a long period of like, or you're gonna just use your kernel, like your own kernel instead of the distro's kernel then I would just use your own distro's build system. So most Linux distributions have some way of letting you use your own kernel, right? Um, Ubuntu, Ubuntu has a guide, Arc has a guide, and so on. And yeah, if you use Gentoo, I think you should know how to compile a kernel. <coughs> but if you're just doing tests, you know, you can just overwrite your, the, you can just replace the kernel you're using for a while. Um, it, it's fine. Yeah. Um, so, what kind of changes can you make, or can you make to the kernel? So, you can you can like make documentation changes, right? And if you are not that familiar with the code yet, actually, that's one way to get familiar with the code, right? Help them document it, because the kernel doc documentation is quite, um, I would say, it's not very good, lah. Um, and they they know that they know that kernel developers know that the documentation is not very good, um, and they would definitely appreciate it if you help them write documentation, definitely. Um, Okay, so what, am I, what, what this patch is, is basically <laughs> um, someone's four-year-old. Uh, so this guy is a kernel developer, Taro, right? And his four-year-old was looking at the, <laughs> looking at the screen when, while he was working on it. And, and like, basically, like, this, you see, the, the dashes don't cover this S. So his four-year-old, <laughs> his, his kid made a comment about it. And, you know, uh, we have a patch to fix that. Yeah, it's a real patch. You can click on it. So things like that, or, or yeah, you know, any any or more serious things like you can document a subsystem as you are working through it and so on. Um, 
or you can like if you encounter bugs in drivers, which I guess this is the most common kind of like if you're not actively working on a Linux kernel, then this is probably the most common thing that you would do. Like you encounter a kernel bug or crash while you're using your system and you debug it and you figure out a fix, then you can commit that as you, you know you if you figure out a fix then you contribute that. So what when you can encounter a bug um, of course, you search the mailing list, see if anyone has encountered a bug, because in most of the time, someone has, right? But most of the time, there is no fix. <laughs> um, yeah, and then check your logs. So usually, if there's a bug, then if there's a, like, okay, if there's a issue, then usually, or well, most of the time, there will be some log output. And you can, that will give you a hint to, like, maybe where you should be looking at. Um, so this kernel bug is not, like, a bug, but a uh, bug is a uh, assert failure. So bug is just one kind of assert. It's actually the, I, if I remember correctly, it's the most serious like assert. Um, yeah. So this assert failure, and you know, so you it points you to this line in the kernel source. So you just go look at it. Um, and how do you debug the kernel? Well, it's a bit complicated because like you, if you're running the kernel on your own system. Then you can't possibly attach a debugger to your own system unless you have another computer and like you can. If you're, for example, if you're debugging a Raspberry Pi, you could like JTAG and debug that. But if you're like debugging the x86 driver, it's a bit hard to attach the debugger unless you have special hardware to do that. So in general, when you're debugging a kernel, um, either you run in a VM like QEMU, uh, KVM, and then you can attach GDB to that. Or you just use printf debugging or printk debugging, right? And yeah, really, um, no, that, that, that's all you can do, la. <laughs> Because you can't attach a debugger, and well, printk is basically the kernel's version of printf because there's no standard library. And there are also um, switches to enable diagnostics and so on. So that one you have to check the documentation, depending on your subsystem. Um, so when you encounter a bug, actually, one of the first things you should do, maybe just email the mailing list. Because there are people who are, the, you know, the people who work on the subsystem every day will be looking at it. And um, you just send a bug, say, oh, I have this bug. I'm trying to debug it. Um, and they will give you pointers, because they, they are more than willing to help you if you're, if you're trying to fix something. So they give you ideas like, oh, maybe you can enable this for diagnostics, um, and look at this, look at this, and so on. And yeah. so. Yeah, that's one of the things also, like if you are contributing, actually this applies to any open source project. Like, don't be afraid to just email and ask for ideas or go on like um, IRC or something and ask for ideas. It really helps. Right. Uh, okay, and, and last thing is that Linus Torvalds has um, actually said something about, uh, he said that he is against kernel debuggers, so you can go and read his email. But anyway, this is 19 years ago, but I don't think he has changed his opinion. Uh. <laughs> uh, Linus is quite stubborn. Okay, and other resources. So, um, uh, like the if you ever need to search through the kernel, well, it's 15 million lines. So there are people who have created um, these source cross-reference tools, and basically you can go there. It's like list all the you know, list all the versions and the source, and you can just search for an identifier, like say, um, let's say panic. And then it will tell you, oh, it's defined here, and so on. Then you can just look at it. It, it helps you. La. And the other option, yeah, the good thing about this is like, um, like types and so on is you can click on it, and it will help you search for it. Um, the other thing is, of course, you just git grab or rg. rg is rip grab. Right. Um, so I just want to say that um, if you're searching through a git repo, you should use git grab instead of grab, right? because git grab will look look at the index or pack files. So it's slightly more efficient in terms of I.O. Or if not, you can just use RG. So RG is this uh, grab replacement written in Rust, and it's apparently very fast. Right? And other tools, like the standard stuff, like git blame, if you ever need to figure out who broke something. So I have actually done this. So someone actually broke, um, well not broke, but added. Uh, <coughs> so what happened was that um, my old laptop, um, every time the battery dropped a percentage, I would get a random keystroke on my screen. Right? 
So what happens? So um, what happened was actually that um, uh, there is a input <coughs> device. Well, it's not input. But it's not input device. More, like, if I remember correctly, it was an uh, ACP event, ACPI event. But the so this person. Um, so some of the ACPI events are like uh, that come through are like you know like uh, some laptops have like tablet modes. So when you convert to tablet mode, it's actually reflected as an ACPI call, and then um, it's bubbled up to. So the driver that handling that ACPI device was um, represented as a Linux input device, which makes sense because that's how um, input devices are. But the thing is, when he encountered um, an unhandled call. He just sent it as a, he just sent it as a input a keyboard stroke for some strange reason, and so for my laptop, the battery whenever the battery level change change it will be an ACPI event, and it was not handled in that driver, so it got reflected as a keyboard key press, and every time my battery dropped, I would get a key press, which was very annoying. So of course, like I went to debug it. So there are tools you can use for this, like. For in my case, it was lib input. So uh, I figured out which input device it was coming from. Then each, the input device will have been coming from a kernel driver. So I go and look at the kernel driver. Then I figure out why, where that input uh, keystroke was coming from. Then I go and git blame and go and see that, OK, this person made this change. And actually, I email him and ask him why he did this. So that, that's, that's also the other thing about uh, actually open source in general. Like you, 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 People can email you years later about why, why um, something you, some change you made, and ask you like, wh why do you do this? You know. Yeah, and uh, actually, I, and then after I removed that, that fallback um, key press because like it doesn't make sense. Uh, why were you? you no, know. but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so that was one of my. That was a patch that I submitted to the kernel. Um, yeah. So other resources you can look at the mailing list archives, the documentation, which is, which as I said, it wasn't. It's not very good, but there's a lot of things there. Also a lot of uh, opinions and philosophies that are there also. And also kernel newbies, it's a community for people who are new to con contributing to the kernel. Um, there are also like IRC channels like uh, kernel on uh, Freenode. I think OFTC as well, and so on. So, and I think most people here don't use IRC, right? OK, so then now we'll look at a demo. OK, so my demo is I am going to um, show, like, so my idea is to add a backdoor to, this is just a random idea, OK? Don't actually try and commit this to the kernel. <laughs> 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 so my idea is to add a backdoor to def now, so when I write a certain string to it, my process uh, UID is changed to root, right? OK, so. Okay, so so let's uh, okay. We need some background information here. So I want to modify the right handler for this uh, def now. So def now in kernel in uh, Linux is a uh, character device, right? Because um, Linux follows this philosophy of basically everything is a file. So uh, def now is a character device, and what it does is basically it's a virtual device. And well, if you use Linux, you'll know that if you whatever you write to def now is discarded. And whenever you read from def now, uh, well, it just gives you end of file immediately, lah. So, and okay, and in Linux we have this thing. I'm not sure about other OSs, but in Linux we have devices are represented by like major and minor numbers. And yeah, so let's just uh, so we, now we need to figure out where are we going to make this change. So I'm just going to use um, uh, the cross referencing tool. And well, so we um, I'll take this chance also to go through like the kernel source layout. So we have a number of folders, right? Documentation, documentation licenses. So the rest of these are basically source code, except like um, scripts and tools. Those are just built tools, right? So 
This one is architecture-specific code. These are block devices. Um, crypto code. These are, these are, this is probably the biggest part of the Linux curl, which are all the device drivers. Um, you know. um, these are file system drivers. And memory management, the network, um, networking code, security, sound, etc. So we remember what we had here was a character device, right? So I'm just going to go on a hunch and we look at FS. Okay, I mean, actually, I looked through this, so I know. And then we see, oh, OK, character device. So we just go through and see, OK. So we have this major minor number. Where is our device created? Because when we find where the device is created, then we also, most likely, the code for handling the writes is also nearby. So oh, OK, we have this thing called register character device. So I'm just going to. OK, I'm just going to click on this. And um, you can see where it's used. OK. So it's referenced in a number of places. But um, I think the one we are looking for is in the header. right? Because they have this. So you see this underscore, underscore. So it means it's some sort of internal function. Uh, the one that people call is probably not that one. So we have to look for the one that is the people actually call, which is this um, register character device. So let's, let's look for what uses that. And it's referenced in a lot of files. And OK, so there's a number of files here, but um, you know, I might want to take a look at this because def now is like it works in memory. OK, I, I mean, I hunt, I, I'm sort of cheating like, because I already know where it is. But yeah, um, then you look through, OK, let's see, there's now here. So we have found where this uh, def now is created. Um, and so. You look at the struct here. So there's a name of device. Also, although this isn't actually used, like it's just internal. Um, like your def now could you could create a def now anywhere else and call it anything because all that matters is the device major and minor number. Um, so what we're looking at is the what we want to look at is the file operations. So what happens when you write or read from the device? So def now is defined by this now. Oops, right, and it's defined here. Line eight to three. So and then we finally, when you read from it, read now. When you write to it, write now. So let's just search for right now. Let's go to. And so it's here. So basically, all this does is it says that it just returns the count of bytes because it just discards your data, right? Okay. So now we know that we need to make our changes here. And um, so let's go and uh, actually make our changes. OK, so I actually don't have the Linux kernel on my, uh, my laptop because I don't want to trash my SSD. I'm a bit paranoid about it. Uh, it's like, the, seriously, the, the, the tree is something like, uh, oops. Let's see. Ah, 1.7 gig. And if you actually just take the whole folder, oh, OK, 3 gig. It's, but it's a lot of files, so I don't want, and I don't want to be compiling the kernel on my laptop, right? So I just have it on a compute cluster. Okay. Oh, actually, so. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So. Okay, what was I? Okay, I wanted to um, add a backdoor to that. Def now. So let's actually look at the. Uh, oops. Yeah. So actually, I, I the Git on the compute cluster is like one point something. So I have my own Git, and I always forget to source my um, path because I don't want to automatically sort overwrite my path with my own local path. So I, <laughs> but I always forget to do it. So I have some. I just replace Git with. Uh, a script that tells me to source my profile. OK. So um, let's just cut it short. So we modify our function, right? So what we want to do is, um, is it visible? 
Is it readable from behind? Is it better? Yeah. OK. So what we're doing is basically we check. OK. So the idea is if I write this to def now, then I'm going to become root. So uh, basically, we just check if count is 23. Basically, this is the number of bytes we're writing. Then, yeah. So we copy from user space. So we cannot access this uh, buff. So this buff is what the user is writing, right? We cannot access it directly because it's a pointer to user memory. And you know it could be invalid and so on. So we don't want to access it directly. So we have helper functions that help us access user memory. And they won't, like these helper functions will check if the memory is accessible and so on. And you know, uh, uh, return the appropriate errors when it's not. So we copy the memory to our internal buffer. And then we check and then compare and check is the, our magic string. And then, yeah, so we prepare our set of credentials. Okay, so this part comes from the Linux security subsystem, which is, uh, well, which is documented here. So I'm just going through my thought process as I wrote this. Uh, maybe it will help. So it's written here, and then it says here, oh, how do we alter credentials, right? So it tells us that, OK, we should uh, prepare a new set of uh, cred struct. We should prepare a new cred struct by calling prepare creds and modify it. And once we're done, we commit it. So it's quite clean because it has been wrapped into a nice API for us. Right. So we just prepare, set our, set our user, ID, uh, user ID and group ID to 0. OK, OK, yeah, the return value. Um, is that what you're asking? Yeah, return yeah. Value. So copy from user returns the number of bytes that were not copied. So we want 0 la, because we want them. If it has some bytes not copied, it means the, something is wrong already. So zero is success. yeah, 0 is success. And memcmp, yeah, la, we want it to be equal, so 0. Um, yeah. And um, I don't know if you all know, like, you know, people always say that label uh, go to is bad, but I think in C code, generally, you just, like, it's quite standard for error handling. Yeah. So yeah, we set the UID and group ID to 0. So all these other, um, uh, maybe I just mentioned, uh, this is the safe UID, um, effective UID. And this is the UID used for NFS access, uh, just <coughs> some kernel um, or Linux things. Uh. So we just set it to 0, and we commit it. And that's it. Uh, we, the, everything else just works as if the same. So now. Um, we have written our code, right? So we compile a kernel, which I won't show. Um, and then we have to test whether it works. So so I actually use a Alpine Linux VM. So let's just run <coughs> it. Um, so actually, oh. yeah, let's wait for the VM to boot up. So I have now I'm using the unmodified 5.0.7 kernel, right? Okay, so this is just uh, I'm using QEMU with uh, in, in case anyone uses QEMU here, I'm using QEMU with the graphical UI disabled. So I'm just this is the output to the serial console, which is why you hear TTY is zero. So I'm just going to log in as nobody. Yeah, I, normally nobody is disabled, but I enable it just for sake of demonstration. So now. Let me just check I'm using the, oh, OK, I have the backdoor kernel. Um, so OK, when you normally, when you write something to def now, nothing happens, right? But now, let me just show you that I am, I'm nobody, right? And now I'm going to, so the dash n just says don't append a new line, because we need to emit the exact bytes. 174, right? Oh, so it works. OK. So yeah, so our patch works. So now we can uh, commit it. Lah. So I'm just going to power off. So I'm root now, right? So I can power off the system. So it'll power off. Just give me a moment. Yeah, so we're done. OK, so now I'm going to commit and I have to write a good commit message. So actually, I already made the commit, but yeah. So 
you will have your real name and then you have your title and say that, oh, okay, so why do you make this commit and so on? And then at the end, signed off by my real name. Okay, so you have your commits. So normally you won't, okay, if you're writing a big change, then you divide it logically into, you know, um, commits, as far as, as far as possible, you should divide your commits into, sorry, you should divide your change into independent commits that like, um, sort of can, as far as possible. Uh, um, you should divide them into commits that are sort of independent and can be applied independently. Although they might not do anything on their own, <coughs> but the kernel should still work when you apply them independently, as far as possible. Uh. I mean, it may not be possible. Then in that case, you can have some dependencies. But as far as possible, you should remove them. And I, I think this should be applied to any, any kind of git PR you do. Uh. As far as possible, you should divide your changes into commits that can be indi applied independently. And when you apply each commit, they don't break. Like at each stage, your code base is still compilable and it passes all the tests as far as possible. But just, you know, most people don't bother. Okay, so we have a, we have a patch. So uh, I'm just gonna git format patch. Actually, I already I already did that, but so format patch will format will just generate patch files for all the commits from the commit you specify here. So we only have one commit, so I'm just going to reference the commit just before this commit. Right? So we have our patch file. And um, yeah, so now we're going to run uh, the script switch. Let's check the style. Sorry. Oh, check patch. Right, so um, I have some style issues, which you know, if you actually go and commit this, then if you're going to actually send this, then you will of course fix all these issues, lah. So basically, these are just code style issues, which you know. Um, okay, and then the the pet the script is is written in Perl, but you can actually fix your C style. So I, I don't even want to look at the 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 script source code, mm -hmm. but yeah. <laughs> okay, then let's uh, figure out who we are going to send this patch to. Okay, so it says that we should send it to these people. Is it too small? Sorry. Yeah. Okay, then finally, now we know uh, we have a patch and we know who to send it to, so let's actually send it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm not going to send it. Okay, so I personally use Thunderbolt, so I'll just show you how. It so, in Thunderbolt, uh, Thunderbolt, Thunderbird, <laughs> Thunderbird. Um, Cause okay, let's just actually look at the patch file, right? So the patch file is actually generated as a valid email file. So if you're using a sane client, like for example, Mart, Thunderbird, anything. You can just import the email file straight in. And yeah. So I'm just gonna I'm just gonna import the email in. Whoa. Right. And yeah, so now my patch is done. Right. So it's a draft message and my patch is all here. And if I can show you, yeah, so the tabs are preserved. Right. So let's edit the thing, and then of course, if we're going to send it, then I will just add in um, the people I'm going to send it to and send it. Lah. So that's it. And then you wait for your feedback, and so on. Yeah. Okay. So that's basically it. That's it for my talk. Uh, the last part is, so uh, why do you use Linux? Because you can do this, okay? <laughs> or actually, okay, um, you can use BSDs too. You can actually, you can contribute and look at the source for BSDs, but you know, Linux is the one with like the most uh, development work done on it and so on. So, you know, why Linux? Because of this. You can, if something breaks, you can go in and see what's wrong and even fix it yourself. You can't do that for Windows, right? Or Mac. Yeah, so that's all I have. Um, are there any